Okay, so ever since I was a little boy, all in black and white, I, I oh bless you, <laughs> I, um, I like to make these plastic model kits and Airfix was the big company that provided these kits that you could make something from. And you, so I, I don't want to be stereotyp, I don't want to stereotype anyone, but I'm sure a lot of the, the men in the room are familiar with this layout of a kit of pots, and I'm so, sure many of the, the women are as well. Maybe I shouldn't have gone there. But the idea is you'd have a set of parts, you know, maybe aeroplane parts, car parts, and you could build aeroplanes, or you could build cars, or you could build Millennia Falcon. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what the plural for Millennium Falcons is. You go from mother-in-law to mother's-in-law, so I figured you'd go to Millennia Falcon. But if you had your Millennia Falcon, you might then sort of act out scenes from your favourite movies with your toys. But the, the point is that it, it occurred to me, while I had to come up with something to talk about today, that building plastic model kits on a good day it was a little bit like computer programming i think for me the days where i feel happiest with what i've achieved are the days where i've written the smallest amount of code and all i've done is i've cherry picked from things that were already out there whether it's an algorithm or a function or an sdk or a bit of hardware or a library all I've done is I've picked things from a kit of parts. I've maybe written a little bit of glue um, to put them all together. And out of that, I've created a new thing. So within Dialog, then, within the company, with, with all of the tools and the bits and pieces that we have available to us, that got me thinking, you know, what is the... If, if Dialog was an Airfix kit of parts, OK, what would that look like? What would our parts be that we could put together and do cool things with? So, of course, our key part then is our Dialog APL interpreter, the living, beating heart of everything that we do. It's got your data in it, usually, has your code in it, usually, and it crunches the numbers and makes stuff happen. And for years we've had that on Unix systems with, with a TTY interface and we've had obviously um, the Windows um, product with its rich um, development environment. Now, you know, and those things have both been hugely popular, but the, the Windows development environment that we have obviously is, is stuck on Windows. And the TTY version that we have is very well and good, but a little bit restricted in what it can do. So the next part that we have, that we've recently introduced, is, is RIDE. And what RIDE allowed us to do, um, first of all internally, is it allowed us to split the interpretive development from the um, development environment, the IDE um, thing. And that meant that we could accelerate our development of the interpreter and our deployment of our interpreter onto new platforms. Um, and that meant we could get our interpreter onto the Raspberry Pi very quickly because we didn't need to worry about writing an IDE on the Raspberry Pi because we knew that we could create a ride. And of course, ride would, could run on the Raspberry Pi but also could run on other machines. And we could connect from our Windows desktop to an APL uh, application that was running on the Pi. Or we could connect from uh, a Unix desktop um, that was running a ride and connect to an APL running on the Pi. And of course, then that also got us on Mac OS. You know, once we had Ride, it was much easier to see how we would get uh, a Mac OS version of Dialog APL um, <coughs> out to you. Now, um, so I'll just now uh, just give you a quick look at Ride on Mac OS X. Every time, so I'll just explain what I'm doing. I'm running on a Mac here. Um, everything I'm doing today is on the Mac. No Windows. No, I was going to say no Microsoft tools, but I am using PowerPoint, but it is PowerPoint on the Mac. Everything is Unix-based, everything is, is on the Mac. So I've got two virtual desktops here. One's running my PowerPoint, and one is running my, my desktop. And what I have then down here, obviously, is the Dialog 15 for the Mac, 
which consists of two components. Hopefully, the, the, everyone can read the font there. But basically, we have our, our ride, which is our new... I think I've just forwarded my PowerPoint a million slides by pressing the wrong... No, I haven't. Okay, so what we've got is we've got our ride, and our ride is connected with a socket to an APL interpreter separate process which is running, and we can do all the usual things. We can do paren lib, we get a list of... Oh, there's an apple core there, you didn't see that. Um, I used to think 2 plus 2, plus two was the coolest thing you could write uh, in an APL session. It turns out, someone told me a couple of years that I've been wrong for, what, 25 years. It turns out that iota 100 is the coolest thing that you could write <laughs> in an APL session. But the point is that ride, because we've got ride, we can now get the interpreter onto new platforms and connect to it, and we can talk to Pies and OSXs and all sorts of things. Now, one of the reasons why we could get on the Pi and on OSX, Mac OS it is now so quickly, was because they're both essentially Unix systems. Um, and for as long as there's been a Dialog APL, it's been running on Unix systems. Okay. And Unix systems are essentially in places you wouldn't imagine. Okay. I was talking to Paul Grosvenor the other day, and he said his, his washing machine's probably got uh, <laughs> Unix running on it. Not a surprise, it probably does. All of these smart things are running an operating system of some sort. Um, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's going, to be, uh, going to be Unix. Now... Um, yeah, so it's running all over the place. So, for example, what I've got here in my hand, I'm just um, making sure that it's going to work because it's, it doesn't want to. Oh, wait a minute, hold it right. It is rebooting. Anyway, so what this is, this is about a four-year-old Asus Nexus 7 tablet. It runs Unix. It's got a Unix operating system um, sitting on it. More importantly, on top of that Unix operating system, it's got Android running on it. So Android is a GUI layer on top of a Unix system. So it's running Unix. As it, if it's running Unix, that means in theory that we can put a dialog APL interpreter on it. If we can put a Dialog APL interpreter on it, we can connect Ride to that Dialog APL interpreter on it and access a Dialog APL interpreter running on an Android tablet. Now, when it's finished booting, <laughs> I will be able to remove that in theory part and show you in practice a Ride session talking to a Dialog APL interpreter on the tablet. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed that A, it does boot and doesn't die completely, and also that um, when, it connects it, when it does boot, it connects to the Wi-Fi again. But um, the key thing is, you know, it's a, it's a Unix box. We've had 33 years' experience of putting APL interpreters on a Unix box. And there will now be a short pause while that boots and I get a glass of water. It's nearly there. It's thinking hard about it. I think when we get to this end of, uh, end of this presentation, you see the list of pending expense claims that are coming in. <laughs> right, let's see if we're anywhere nearer. <laughs> yes. Okay, right, so that hopefully, cross your fingers, that hopefully is there. So, from our ride session on our Mac OS machine, we can go to the connect file connect, and what we'll do is we'll just connect to this anonymous thing. And if it's managed to get on the network, and it's right. So. Here is an APR session. Oh, yeah, look, there's a clue, isn't there? Look, it says that it, it could mean anything. <laughs> but we can do all the usual things. We can write the coolest APL expression in the world. 
ever. We can do iota 100. We can do paren lib, we've got stuff. We can load a display workspace and we can display all of us. We can dip slay. Never live type in a demonstration. That, that, that stuff will ruin your reputation. So we can do all of that sort of stuff. We can even load something like the Sudoku workspace. If I can spell it. Sudoku. And we could do Sudoku. Sudoku. That's right, S1999. And it will go through and it will solve that sample Sudoku thing. All of this is running on the, the, the tablet. In fact... Okay. What is the Ah, well... It's about... What's that? It's about 64 meg, I think. But no, so there's things, it's all sorts. Is it, so I can do a Prentice H LS, I can do a Prentice H CAT. I can do. Man, it's a good crowd. No, I don't, you're right. I mean, SH CAT slash proc slash CPU info. And we're running on a, some sort of ARM chip. Better than that, I can type slash proc, cat proc, make your own words up, um, version. And here we get the two magic words. We get Linux here, it's running Unix, and we get Android over here. So we've got this interpreter that's running on the Android device. And if I press the magic button pointed at this thing, Oh, and because I had to reboot the machine, I have to come over here and press the magic button on this thing. Uh, right, bear with me while I remember how to do that. So, it's not particularly interesting on the device. What we have here is we have a package, an application that's installed on the device that's sole raison d'etre is to give me an interpreter that I can connect to so that I can do IOTA 100 on an Android device. And I can show you that the interpreter can run on an Android device. Now, fantastic, but pretty useless really. Let me, um, I mean, it's cool, it's, it's cool, but useless. So let me just do a print off from that, and we'll see that the device... If you trip over a wire, worry about the electronics rather than yourself. Right, so, so look, it's an Android device, it's got, it's got stuff on it. I've enabled the finger touch, so that little circle is where my finger is on the device. And we have the little dialog icon, icon in the middle, which is what I clicked to start the interpreter before I showed you what was going on. But we couldn't do anything with that. So in this, and I apologize, I can't make this any bigger. OK. Um, so if you can't read it, just make up what you think it says. But in the top left-hand corner, there's a little app here. And what this says is it's blank dialog app. And this is a separate little application I've installed on the machine, which is configured to, in some way, allow us to create GUI from APL to build a real application on the device. So I'm going to click on this guy. And, well, nothing happens. OK, and the reason nothing happens is, well, I'll show you. We'll connect to it. So we'll do exactly what we did before. We'll connect to this APL session on the device. And, well, would you look at that? We've got an error. <laughs> OK, so here we are again. We're on the same Android device. There is very little in my workspace. I've got a function called LX, which has been given an argument called activity, and all it's done is it's done a global assignment to something called uppercase activity. And what an activity is, is it's essentially it's a, it's a reference to um, your application. Okay, so the, the, the thing that's running. Now, it is at this point 
that I realize I've missed some steps in the PowerPoint. So what we'll do is we'll just go back to the PowerPoint and I will add my missing part, which is my Android device. And I will... This slide was to remind me to go to the Android device to demonstrate it, so we've done that. <laughs> OK, so if we're going to be talking about putting GUI on an Android device, we have a number of choices, and some of them have been discussed today. Um, Morton was talking about um, creating... Well, in fact, I've got a list here. One of the options we've got is um, Java. A lot of applications that you see on Android devices are using the Android GUI, most of which is implemented in Java, um, and you can use various tools to access that object model and build up some GUI. You can do that on all the platforms. You can do that from Win Windows desktops and Unix desktops and Mac OS desktops. Good thing about Java is you can also use it to build applications, not only for Android devices, but also for all of those desktops. What Morton mentioned is what's even more portable, perhaps, than Java, is to do things in HTML. All of the devices that, that you see have some sort of web renderer on them, and if they haven't, you can install one and you can render HTML. Um, and we could do that with APL-centric approach, like Morton demonstrated this morning with the... Um, uh, the my server plugin and the embedded CEF thing. Um, or we could go a more IT oriented route and do something like Cordova, which is a development environment where you can package up essentially something that looks like a website. You could package that all up and install it on a device as a standalone application. And there's a few other options. Xamarin is something which shares an object model between Android and iOS. It's owned by Microsoft, and as far as I'm aware, you can only develop on Windows. Okay, um, And another option is maybe the Weird Dialog could produce our own object model which is designed from the ground up to be portable and get you on all these platforms. So that would be as portable as we could make it. Going back to my kit apart, it was in Boston, I think, in 2011. I mean, whenever there's lots of APL programs in a room, we'll have that discussion about what year APL conferences were in. Anyway... It was in Boston in 2011 that I demonstrated a Java bridge on Mac OS to produce GUI on a desktop. There's always one part that's upside down and you can never find it because it's upside down. <laughs> I like this little detail as well. Um, but building software from a kit of parts, everything that we've got here already exists. Okay? I already have a Java bridge. I showed it to you five years ago. So in theory, it should just work on a device that's running Unix where we've got an interpreter that should just work. This is now the reminder for me to go back to the point that I was at when we left. So what we've got here then is we're in our uh, APL session running on the device. Okay, we're remotely connected to it um, through Ride. So this activity here is essentially an instance of a object that um, was created in, in the Java side. Activity. And it's just, it's just a thing. It's, it's prefixed by the name of my application, which was com.dialog.blank, and it's an activity. Okay. So far, so good. So rather than write a bunch of code, because I can't type when I'm stood up in front of a, hundred, a bunch of people, um, I'm going to copy some stuff from a workspace which is on the SD card of the device. Okay, we've got access to the file system, we can put workspaces there, we can load them, we can do stuff. And I've got a thing called GTILs. And in here I've got a number of useful functions. None of them are particularly big. I think add, no not add, I think new is the largest. And it basically is a cover on quad new. The thing with um, Java programming is generally that you always have to specify what application or what activity you want to create the GUI as a part of. You generally always have to specify some default sizes. Um, so basically, these first few lines are just f factoring out all of that stuff that you always have to do. And then this stuff at the bottom here, set props, that just allows me, when I call new, to specify some name value pairs. And then when we call new, they get punted off to property assignments and so on. So this is going to create a new instance of the Java class that we pass in our arguments. 
um, and associate it with the activity that we are currently running. So I can do something like OK, get quad, no, not quad, new button. And I can say text, oh, I don't know, click me. Make it exciting, we'll put an explanation mark on there. OK, so what we've got there is a Android button. There's a function called event, which allows me to say when it's clicked. Let's call a function foo. OK, and if memory serves, foo just gets given the button as the argument. So we can do a.text. Yes? Oh, right, so, but, okay, so this, is, this comes back to this, the notion that with this Java bridge that we have, so, um, and I should have explained that. We have on the Windows platform, we have a .NET bridge, okay, and basically what that allows you to do is to configure your workspace so that things that might otherwise be a value error in your workspace can be accessed through the .NET framework. So if we reference something called button on .NET, the interpreter would go off and realize that that was a reference to the button class in .NET. And exactly the same thing has happened here, except the interpreter has gone off and realized that button is a reference to the Android GUI class that's called button. Okay, so every time that, um, and I think generally actually I've tried to call all of my things either all in uppercase or all in lowercase. So any mixed case thing, probably something to do with, with the Java object model or the Android object model. Okay? So what we're going to do here is going to do a.text, oh, I don't know, comma gets, oh, I know, what, thank you, you've pressed me, thank you. Okay, so that's that. And then the last thing that we need to do is associate, oh, and I've got to run on click. The last thing then we've got to do is we've got to associate our button in some fashion with the root of our GUI. And I have a simple function called add that um, takes the button as the argument and it will add the button to our GUI. Now, we don't see that yet, because the way the Android model works is when you're in the middle of a callback, which we are, because we're running this thing called well, X, which is okay, it's essentially it's a callback, um, nothing will change in the GUI unless we come out of that callback and let things carry on again. So if we do branch to quad LC, no, we'll branch to zero here. There's our button. I'm wirelessly connected, so I can, I can do the cool TED type thing. <laughs> ah, look at that. <laughs> well, okay, that's good. Okay, so I've done something wrong. Clearly it's failed, but great, we've got a debugger. We can look at it, we can figure out what I've done wrong. I suspect what's happened here is that A is probably uh, an array, so I need to dig the first element out of that. So let's just uh, come to my function. We'll edit this and we'll do the first of a dot text. Oh, sorry, I'm in quadml, the one that you don't like. <laughs> and I'm just, just because I'm now scared that I'm going to get something else wrong, pick a dot text, comma, thank you. So we'll run that. And then we'll just do a branch to zero again. And our button now says, click me, thank you. And of course, if I click again, it's really great. Yeah. And of course, I said, <laughs> some of those default size things that I set up when I created the button without specifying a specific size said, you know, make yourself as big as you need to be to display your content. And I guess if I keep clicking this, it's going to... It's, it's a very happy and very grateful button. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's a simple bit of GUI that we can do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come off, I'm going to do a print off. That's all going to go away. We can see that my ride interpreter has become disconnected because the process has gone away. That's okay. We don't care about that. Let's come into our blank application again. We didn't save anything, so it's still stopped in the same place that it was stopped before. Uh, so we need to connect to it again. Hopefully everything's going to work. 
Excellent. So this time we'll do something slightly different. We will copy in from the SD card from our dialog directory, we'll copy in a thing called Sudoku. And in here, there is a function called Sudoku. What this does, I'll make this bigger. I've, I've, I've intentionally moved the session to the top of the window because I noticed when I was sitting at the front, and certainly over here, it was hard to see what was going on at the bottom of the script. You, you didn't see that, right? <laughs> but the... Um, Okay, so what that was, that was a problem in Ride, but that's okay because um, my process on Android is just working. It starts again, Android, uh, sorry, Ride reconnects everything up. So here's my Sudoku function. This is quite cool, but it doesn't do much that we haven't already seen. It creates some linear layouts, these are things that do horizontal and vertical layout of controls. Three buttons, three callbacks. It creates this thing called a relative layout which is just something that allows us to create an area where we can specify the positions of control specifically by X and Y coordinate. So we're going to create a bunch of these things called dialog spinners, which are... It's basically just a, a simple cover that I made on, on the built-in um, Android spinner class. And we're going to create a 9 by 9 grid of dialog spinners. Oh. Okay, and then we're going to basically join up our, our bits and pieces of GUI, and that's about it. So let's run Sudoku. Sudoku. Okay, and it'll come back. You'll say done when it's done. Okay, and then we'll do branch 2.0 again. And what we get here now is we get our three buttons and our little Sudoku layout. And um, so when I press next on here, what happens here? This uses, oh, is, is, um, is Arthur Whitney in the room? I mean, this Sudoku solver was written by Arthur Whitney initially. And then, of course, was demonstrated very well by John Scholes at one of the conferences and then on YouTube. So the actual Sudoku solving, you've, you've probably all seen before. All I've done is put this GUI front end on it. So what happens is when I hit the next button, the, one of those callbacks goes off and it, it runs the entire sequence of Sudoku to solve the entire puzzle from this starting position. So the first time we, we press this, it may take a wee while. But once it's calculated it, because that button's got next on it, it will put lift two in that bottom left-hand corner because that's the first stage in the Sudoku solving process. Now it's done that calculation, I can just hit next, 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 and it will go through and we can see how the program is solving the puzzle. There are some 16,000 steps in the solving of this particular solution. So fortunately, I've got a button that just says solve that takes us to the last one. I've got a button that says reset, takes me all the way back to the beginning. These controls I said were, were spinners. Okay, they have a list of items in them. So I can click on this guy and I can say, let's make that a six. Let's solve that particular puzzle. <coughs> Again, the numbers have changed. It's recasting the whole thing. And any moment now, it's just going to come and fill in everything and say, OK, that worked, and your six is still in that top thing. OK? So when, you know, ship it. <laughs> right, so apparently I'm already two-thirds of the way through my time. So, because um, we haven't even started with the cool stuff yet. So... I'm going to miss a chunk, because I have to. Um, so, the next bit that we're missing is data binding. And, and Mike, you know, did an admirable job of explaining data, data binding over the internet. He hopefully refreshed your memories about the data binding that I already, we already had between the workspace and WPF. What we have on the Android devices, then, is data binding between the workspace that's running on the device. There's, remember, there is a dialog APL interpreter running on here, with a workspace in it, OK? Um, and this didn't use any data binding, OK? But we have got data binding support in, 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 in Dialog and Android. Um, and I'll just go through the PowerPoint here without showing you the actual example. 
This is a slide from a um, presentation I did in 2014 in... Thank you. Um, and what we have here is a little bit of GUI, and when you type in the edit field, we filter through the names on the left and replace them with the names on the right. Um, this is what the... Um, this here is what the code looked like in the WPF version. The Android version, which I can show any of you uh, after this, looks like this. Now, it's essentially the same. We create a namespace, which is our data source, that contains three members, filter, filtered list, and dialogue names. We have the same thing in the Android version. I've changed the names. And the reason the names are different is because I wrote this and then realized, hold on, it's exactly the same as what I've written before. <laughs> but I really didn't have the energy to go through and just change the names. And then we use our 2015 iBeam to create a data source, something that we can bind to from our namespace. The code that then hooks up that um, data source to our GUI is a little bit different. Um, and maybe there's something we can do in the future to reduce some of those differences. Um, and the code then that hooks up a callback to our data source so that we have a callback that gets called when something changes is subtly different as well. But the actual callback that does the work okay, doesn't have any reference to any GUI in it at all. This just references the string filter namespace, which we define down here, and its three variables, filter, strings, and filter. Okay. And the data binding basically says, look, whenever this function is called, possibly because the user has edited the text in the edit field, we will modify the value of filtered, and filtered is the thing that gets displayed. We'll skip through this. Filtered is the thing that gets displayed here. Okay. So we can have a very similar code pattern between what we did in WPF and what we can do on, on Android. The fundamental differences actually are in the, the markup that we've used to create the GUI here. But even here, the concepts are the same. In WPF, we have a concept of a stack panel. In Android, we have a linear layout. In WPF, we have a text box. In Android, we have an edit text. We have another wrap panel, horizontal orientation in Windows but it's a horizontal linear panel on Android, and we have a couple of list views. The concepts are identical. Pretty much, it's just the words that are different. So, I would have shown you that, but I'm in danger of running out of time, and I was told I would, and I didn't believe it. <laughs> so, let's just... Um, let's kill this guy, because we, we do need to crack on a little bit. So, so, I was talking to Tony, he's here, Tony, I was talking to Tony at lunchtime on Sunday, and Tony gave me an idea. What Tony said was, that CDDDV thing that you've, <laughs> that, you've been, that you've not let us hear the back end of for, for 10 years, you know, you're, are you doing anything with that this year? And I sort of thought, you know what, I've got a bit of a slot. I've only got a bit of a slot because I deleted the pie from there. <laughs> so the missing piece is our CD database. So on the device, got a little icon here. It says disks. Let's just run that bad boy. So this uses data binding to talk to the CD database, which is a deep nested matrix in the workspace. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, there is a grid that's populated with the content of the, of the CD database, and we can scroll through this, and, and stuff happens. I'm not going to demonstrate that on there, because in the true spirit of being preparedness, I've prepared a video. I will do my best to give you a voiceover to the video to explain what's going on and how things work. So, here is the application running on a machine. We can use various mechanisms to scroll down through the list on the machine. Have we got any, we're not seeing it, any audio, Jason? Oh, hold on. My fault. Okay, so as we can, we can scroll through these things, all of this content is coming from the data binding. We can search through our fields every time the field changes, like with the string filter I told you, we change the index in our grid so we can see no presentation would be complete without the words Toto in there. 
If we click on one of these things, we get a little pop-up, again, all driven by APL callbacks and the data binding, so we can see the tracks that are on a particular album. Um, we can delete on our filter. We can navigate to another personal favourite of mine, Dream Theatre. The demonstration me is a lot slower than the talking me. Um, and we can see what tracks are available on some of these albums. And in fact, when we select a track, magic happens. And we'll edit this bit out of the video before it goes live. But the application can play the track. Part of the data binding source is the URL of the track, either on the device or online. Oh, I pressed a button to take me to another track. <clears throat> so where's, where's, where's video me going to go now? Okay, let's have a look. He's going to go. He realises that prog rock might not be the thing for all of you. So I think he's going for a little bit of uh, mild jazz of the Joe Sample stuff. What's, um... Oh, yeah, and if I click on a track for which I haven't got the audio, it all just shuts up. You'll notice here, what's happening here with these icons is this is all going through data binding. And if we get to an album art that we haven't got, there's a delay while it downloads it. And now we're into the smooth jazz section of this evening's performance. Thank you very much. What's cool about this is Unix is everywhere. Android is everywhere. I've shown you the Android on the tablet. This one is running on the TV at home, which is, it's, um, it's, a, it's a thing of beauty. That's not a great picture. See if we can find a better picture. There's a slightly better picture. It's a 75-inch bit of Sony goodness. <laughs> here it is. Here it is in all of its glory. Oh, and there's the same icon that I showed you over on this side look, on the TV there. There it is in all of its glory. Not only is it a fantastic bit of kit, it's running Android. It's running Unix. We can put an interpreter on it. This is running on there. We can connect Ride to it. We can debug it. The, the interpreter is running on the television. In the same way the interpreter is running on here, it's running on the television. Not only is this a fantastic bit of kit, but it's probably the best expense claim I'm ever going to put in. <laughs> So, but not all of us have got 75-inch televisions at home, whether they run Android or not. Not all of us have got 7-inch um, tablets. You know, most of us, and I say most of us because I know statistically around the planet, and I suspect in this room, probably two-thirds of you are running, as I do, an Android phone. Okay, the, the other majority, the, most of the other people are running iOS. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncast from here. I'm going to uncast from that, and I'm going to cast from my phone if I can remember how to do it. Let's just go to there. Go to... I wish I could remember. Go to there. Ah, no, it's there, isn't it? That's it. Cast screen. Cast to that. Right, so now this is my phone that's on the projector now. And this guy does the same thing. I've got the app on here. I can do the same stuff. Cache is some. Um, hopefully it'll get those videos in a moment. I went and saw 10cc the other week. They were fantastic. Let's, um, there's probably a lot of you in finance, aren't you? Let's, um, let's go for the Wall Street shuffle. So what's happening here is we're Google casting from the phone to the projector. So not only does that cast the video to the projector, Actually, the audio turns out on the projector as well. Um, I realise not everyone's a 10cc fan, even with the irony of the Wall Street Shuffle. If I just pick something on here that, um, that I haven't got the audio track for, then the whole thing uh, just well, shuts up, really. Let's connect... Um, let's connect our APL session to my phone now. Okay, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's do enclose IOTA 100 quad trace inch split quadrennial. Right. I mean, this isn't going to be particularly interesting, but you'll see there's stuff going on 
as I, as I, I click around. There's a, actually a callback on every single scroll that I do here. I'll explain the reasons for that in a moment. If I want to play a... Oh, and yeah, of course, if I go to the search filter and I start typing something, we'll see that those filter change callbacks that I short showed on the PowerPoint before, that's all working. We can go to Dream Theater again. And if I play Surrounded, we'll see that here's the URL to the audio track. And any second now, that'll start on there. Well, we did notice this week we're getting some hiccups of the audio. Generally, it starts and stops and then starts again. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, we might shut that up a little bit. Oh, I can control the volume from here. <laughs> so that, that's, that's quite cool. But, you know, sometimes... You know, sometimes you're, you're, you're at a friend's house and you're sitting down maybe and you're having a nice little drink. You've not got, you've not got your own television. You've not got... Oh, well, let's just go to, let's go to somewhere else. <coughs> let's just pop this guy up. Just enjoy the tunes. It's all very mellow. It'll kick off in a minute, but hopefully we'll be sorted before we get that far. Uh, what we want, we want to start that guy. Oh, there we go. Look, that's the bottle, top of my bottle of water. This isn't, hasn't turned out to be as slick as I might have hoped. So anyway, sometimes you're at a friend's house. He's not got the 75-inch television that you might have. You've rather foolishly left your, left your phone the, the other side of the room on the rather bizarrely on this podium that, he, that he's got there. But, but you want to browse your CD database to see, see whether some of the CDs you've got are the same as some of the CDs that he's got. You, 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 you need a device. What, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Seven inch device, too big. 75 inch device, definitely too big. Five inch phone, I am going to walk over there to pick up a five inch phone. I'm going to go to my Android watch. <laughs> so, here's my Android watch. Okay. It's got settings, it's got stuff, it's got, it's got apps. Uh, we, we've seen that icon before, haven't we? Let's, let's, oh, oh no, it's time to, let's open that guy up. So what we have here, it takes a second to load, but here we have the same <laughs> application. The interpreter is running on the watch. Okay. The, The workspace is on the watch. Okay, we've got, we can scroll through here. Now, you'll see at the top, there's a little, little caption that says Airplay at the moment. The reason it says Airplay is because that's the band that recorded the CD that's on the top picture. If I scroll through here, it'll change to Al Jiro because he's the guy that ran that CD. And as I scroll through here, the, um, that scroll event that we saw on the phone, but remember, of course, we're not seeing that there because the trace is on the phone, not on the watch. Okay, but you know, every time we scroll, there's a bit of there's a callback in the interpreter that says, "Oh, what's the top item? Oh, it's um, who is it? It's Alana Miles." I'll set the caption to be whoever that artist is. Okay, but this, of course, this is one of those spinner things. This is the drop-down list. Okay, so I realise this isn't going to be in focus, but it's a bit awkward. Um, so I can scroll through this list. We can go to. Um, well, I'll tell you what, let's just go to the beginning because trying to find things alphabetically could take forever. Now, the wonderful thing about Android watches is that generally they can be paired with Android phones. So a lot of the internet connectivity that this is getting, it's getting through the phone. But you can also send messages betwixt one device and the other. So if on this guy I pop up the track listing for this album and if the wind is blowing in the right direction and I click on one of these tracks we'll see a request for the track on the phone and it starts coming out through the phone audio which is which is it's 3d sound it's over there it's over there and it's over there but it's it's all the one thing 
Okay, so Android, Unix is everywhere. It's, it's on your tablet, it's on your television, it's on your phone, and it's on your watch. Dialog APL is running individually on every single one of these devices. We can connect right to every single one of these things to see what's going on. We can write code, we can debug code, we can impress, on, we can impress our friends. And that is because we've got this kit of parts that you just, with a bit of modelling glue, a little bit of a scalpel work every now and again just to take the rough edges off, you can join everything together and create something which I think is, is pretty cool. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> I'm a few minutes over. I'll take questions if you want to come up to the microphone and, and ask them. Failing that, obviously, I'm here all week and I'm willing to demonstrate more, less, talk a little bit more about what's all that's going on. But if there are questions, you, I'll take a couple now. I'm kind of old-fashioned. Could you do 2 plus 2 on a watch? Oh, ah, right. I, yes. Uh, but at the same time... <laughs> the problem is, and, and, it, and it's a real... It's, it's a thing. The, the way the connectivity works between the watch and the phone is through Bluetooth. And if you're connected to the phone via Bluetooth, it disables the Wi-Fi connectivity on the phone, and Ride connects to the interpreter over the, over the Wi-Fi, essentially. So I can't quickly show you that, because I'd have to disconnect from that, make sure that all the IP addresses are correct, which they might not be because I've changed the Wi-Fi network that I'm on. But you can do it. Um, it does work. Um, and... If, so, if you want to see that in this room where I'm, I am connected on the same stuff throughout the week, I can absolutely, definitely and certainly show you that. It would be a pleasure to do so. Anything uh, else? Yeah. Oh, Ziggy. Hi. Uh, how close are you or are we to getting a point when there can be an application written in Dialog for Android or iOS that goes up on the Play Store or the Apple Store that can be downloaded to individual phones and them not realise or necessarily know that they're running an application that's written an APL? Right, well, there's, there's half a dozen questions there. Um, this is Android only. I'm talking to a Java bridge, um, talking to directly to the underlying Java objects that are part of Android. Okay, that has pros and cons. One is that the, the Android, the Google Play Store, we believe is much less restrictive on the sorts of applications you can put on there. And I'm totally confident that an application like this, tidied up, um, made to look prettier, you know, would be accepted on the Android, on the Google Play Store, no questions asked. Okay. On iOS, not only does this stuff not apply on iOS, but in theory we could write a bridge to Xamarin that I mentioned before or to Cocoa Touch. On, a, on an Apple device. We could do that technically, but our feeling is you know, that the restrictions on what you're allowed to do in the Apple store might not make it feasible. That's only a suspicion that we've got. We've not looked at the fine print. What we have heard is that you can look at the fine print as much as you like, but when you submit something to the store, they may find some reason to, to not let you put it on. Okay, so there are all sorts of issues with doing this on iOS rather than on Android. Okay, going back to what I've shown you today, Gitta sort of had an idea about what I was going to talk about. She was being very gracious, saying she had no clue. I wanted to keep it under wraps a little bit. Um, but there are a lot of people at Dialog who haven't seen any of this stuff before. So a lot of this stuff is just blue sky thinking on my part. And this should not be taken as being a product announcement or anything like that. Okay, this is just stuff that I've been playing around with to do stuff that I thought we've call, is, is cool and I think you know, has a future as part of the dialogue suite of things that we do. And all of those other things that we've talked about, doing it with HTML, doing it with Cordova, doing it with Xamarin, I want to do all of those things as well. My feeling is that APL as a programming language should be callable by anything. 
Okay, and in th also we ought to be able to call everything else as well. Um, but I wanted to do this first as a proof of concept, and let's not forget, it's super cool. <laughs> but in terms of getting this, uh, first of all, as a formal product from Dialog, you know, we, we have lots of discussions and things to, to do before we get that far. Um, but, you know, once we have a product, I don't see any problem with the Android agreements, sorry, the Google Play agreements, as much as I understand them about getting this stuff on the Google Store. Any, anything else? Uh, it's a quick te technical question. Under .NET, you have quad using to get all the buttons right. and everything. Well, how are you doing this here? There is a quad using on here as well. And when I did that quad NLIO to nine, that just showed you there was a few functions in there, there were also five or six elements in quad using as well. Okay. I should have made that point, but I was aware that uh, I was probably going to run out of time. But yes, there's a quad using as well. Anything else? Brilliant. All right. Well, if anything, oh, uh, Dan, do you want to come and? If anyone wants to wander off, because I realise we're ten minutes over, then um, you know I won't be terribly is offended. It, is it possible to get any kind of session on the Android device? Right. So uh, yes, it, it is possible. It will be possible. There's nothing in, and, and Nick or Morton will correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's anything in the current ride. Well, in fact, Morton mentioned before ride in a browser as an option. Now, there's no reason why we should not be able to put a ride in some fashion or other on one of these devices, okay? It wasn't my priority because um, I wanted to show, I wanted to get to this. And also, of course, you've got all sorts of physical problems. Having a ride on a, on a five-inch five inch device or a watch, yeah, is it, it, it's, it's sort of crazy. So it might make sense on that. It might make sense on something larger. But for the purposes of the... Um, the majority of the uh, devices that are out there, I don't really think it's something that would be usable, could be used even if we, we provided it. Um, but, I mean, we will provide it on those, those devices that we feel are ergonomically capable of supporting it. Well, yes, I mean, it's not such sensitive, the TV, but you could Bluetooth a keyboard to it and do stuff, so it might be more convenient to... I mean, with the TV stuff, of course, I had the, the laptop... Um, in the living room in front of the TV, debugging it with, with Ride over the Wi-Fi. So I had the app on, on the TV, Ride on the laptop, much as I've shown you today. And there's a lot to be said for that separation as well, of course. Um, if there's nothing else, Gitta, do you have a question or are you wrapping up? No, I'm just wrapping up. All right, well, obviously I'm here all week, so if you've got any questions or comments or thoughts, then, you know, come and, come and find me. And we can, um, as long as we're in the confines of this room or probably just outside where all the Wi-Fi connections are the same, I can go through all of that, that again in more detail, if you like. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. It's whiskey and chocolate tonight. That's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs>